On the new Restaurant Influencers Podcast, you will learn how to tell your story online and how to be found. We have teamed up with Entrepreneur Magazine, Yelp, and Toast, our primary point of sale partner, to bring you this weekly video series. Please subscribe so you do not miss an episode. And if you'd like to learn more about the show, visit us at calibbq.media. Welcome to Restaurant Influencers, powered by Entrepreneur and Yelp. My name is Sean Walchef, owner of Cali Barbecue Media. In life and in the restaurant business, we learn through lessons and stories. This week's guest is Chef Matt Cooper, the executive chef at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, Georgia, where the Atlanta Falcons play. And you can find him at Stadium Chef on Instagram. Chef Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Sean. Appreciate it. So for anybody that follows along the podcast, typically the, the first the first question I ask is where in the world is your favorite stage or venue? But I think you're kind of biased <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not going to put you on the spot. We're going to go ahead and go in a um, that uh, the Mercedes Benz Stadium is your favorite stadium. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Okay, I beautiful. could talk for hours about that. Okay, beautiful. So um, the next question I like to get into is let's let's go to your actual from the stadium, which is phenomenal. Yep. Let's pretend that entrepreneur and Yelp has that stadium, 70,000 seats full of hospitality professionals, people that listen to this podcast, people that want to be better. They're in there and we are all fired up. We've used center stage. We've given you the mic, thousand hospitality professionals, but we want to know your origin story, but your two minute drill. So this is something that if you're listening to this podcast, everyone needs to practice their two minute drill, who you are and what you do and what inspires you. So uh, you ready for that center stage? 70,000 yeah, fans. In, yeah, insta yeah, so, in, uh, instead of being behind the scenes, <laughs> I'm putting you right out in front. You ready? I know, man, it's different. It's different. But yeah, I, I appreciate it. And if I uh, go over the two minutes, cut me off because that's definitely something I need to work on is a, a two minute drill, but I'll try. So all right, here we, here go. we go. Two minute drill um, stadium. So Mercedes Benz Stadium seriously is one of the nicest stadiums in the world. Um, that's the reason I'm here. I love what I do. I've been here for five years since we built the stadium. So um, it's been a long, long time. I have uh, amazing support. I have seven other uh, sous chefs and executive sous chefs and uh, an entire management team at the stadium, best in the business uh, by far. So, uh, but to get into kind of what we do. So just to give a snapshot of the stadium and, and the food and beverage experience, we have over 200 uh, executive suites. I get a very extensive menu. Um, over 50 concession stands and each of those concession stands acts like a standalone restaurant. So um, it really is, we're cooking fresh in there. You know, we have a, a West Nest uh, chicken stand, which is all fresh chicken that we do from scratch. Um, all the barbecue we do in house, thousand pounds of pork butts, thousand pounds of brisket. I mean, just massive volumes that we do in house. Um, clubs and restaurants, we have seven, uh, eight clubs and restaurants, um, all inclusive, all you can eat, all you can drink and catering. We cater the entire building. So anywhere from uh, press, media, locker rooms, uh, childcare for the players. Um, you know, there's about 30 events on a game day. So this place is massive. Um, it's very fast paced and that's what I love about it. And uh, yeah, that's kind of a snapshot of, of what we do. And uh, right now I'm trying to bring kind of the behind the scenes of the food and beverage experience. I think we all know what sports stadiums do and how they operate, but no one really has an idea of what we do uh, behind the scenes at a stadium. So that's kind of my big push right now is to, to bring to light uh, the, the magic that we do behind the scenes. Yeah, I love one of the coolest things about your Instagram at Stadium Chef. Uh, please follow him. But bringing the, the fact that I'm somebody that absolutely, I wouldn't be in the hospitality business. I probably would be, but sports entertainment, that's near and dear to my heart. It's why we opened up the, the restaurant that we opened up. It was, it was a sports entertainment focus. And we do a lot of work here in San Diego um, at the stadiums and with different sports teams. And for me, it's so oh, nice. fascinating, especially when you're talking about getting ready for a Super Bowl. Oh yeah. I would love, I would love for you to talk about the challenges or any problems that you face um, running a venue of that size, running as many restaurants. And it, it's one thing to run a, that amount of restaurants. We have a lot of people that have restaurant groups have multiple units, but it's a lot to run it all at the same time. We're talking yeah, about it sure. event. So can, can you uh, talk about the biggest challenge you face? Um, <laughs> yeah. So um... specifically for Super Bowl, let's do that. Super Bowl, yeah, probably one of the best experiences I've ever had as a as a chef in my profession uh, professional career. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, it boils down to three things, and and I say this, I said this on the last podcast that I was on, and these three things are the most important in our line of work and probably every line of work. Communication that is key. Without communication, we can't do anything. 
and logistics and timing. That that's it. Logistics, timing, communication. If you're if you're good with those three things, um, that's how we're able to execute at such a high level. So just to uh, give an idea of Super Bowl, um, I mean, God, we started planning that thing probably a year out. We were doing walkthroughs with the Super Bowl team. And then um, at least eight months out, six months out, we were working on menu development and um, everything was all from scratch. So the sweet menu for the Super Bowl um, took probably about a month to, to produce and uh, everything down to the vessels, you know, going to uh, home goods and Amazon and, and getting really cool vessels. It's not just about the food. That's what that's what I want to highlight is it's it's all encompassing. So obviously food and food quality is, is up here um, with all of us, but there's so much more involved, the vessel that the food sits in, how it's displayed, how it's, you know, the techniques and plating it, um, all that comes into play. So for Super Bowl, we spend a lot of time with menu development to be unique and uh, make sure that when people come in, um, the first thing they say is, wow, that, that was our goal is to, no matter if you're in a suite, a concession stand, a club, a restaurant, we want people to walk in and say, wow, and remember that experience. And that was uh, 2018. So a um, couple of years, few years ago for me, and I still remember it like it was yesterday because um, we had fun with it. And that's that's another thing I've been wanting to highlight is having fun at work. We, I said, it, you know, I've, I've been here since we built the stadium. It's been five years. And the first, uh, up until the pandemic, honestly, we we're just running super hard, super fast all the time. And we never really stopped and um, spent time to, to have a good time and, and have fun with it. So that's my goal right now is to take these large events show the world what we do. And that's kind of why we're here talking right now is to, to show the behind the scenes of what we do. And uh, that's the overall goal is to, to bring the fun back into it. Um, there's a lot of work, a lot of hard work. And like I said, if we keep up with those three things, we'll always be successful. And uh, it's been proven time and time again. Um, I do want to say Super Bowl, the, the thing that kind of sticks out the most when whenever anyone brings it up is just the amount of um, events that we had. So, uh, it's on my Instagram. I think it's way down when I first started it. And by the way, I just started this Instagram probably six months ago. Um, but it's down there and it, it shows a, a, a packet, um, or paper on a desk about this big. And mm -hmm. each of those are event orders and each event order is a completely different menu. One piece of paper could be 500 people, um, you know, with 20 different items on it. And that stack was, just, I mean, there was, at least 500 pieces of paper that we have to take that information. We have to order the product, obviously bring it in, put it on a separate spreadsheet to be able to communicate to the, the cooks on what they're doing. And, um, and just, you know, the steps involved in executing that amount of work. And that's just one area that's just catering. Um, you know, all the other areas were just as crazy, but it's, it's a magical thing to see everything kind of come together at the end and be able to look back and say, wow, you know, we, we did that. And that's, that's what we did. We had a lot of support fly in from all over the country for that, for the Super Bowl. And afterwards, you know, we all took a picture in the, in the main kitchen and I have that on my wall right now in my office. And, you know, we're able to look at that and say, wow, we, we did a really, really cool thing. So, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun and I want to keep on uh, pushing. We have a lot more events ahead of us. That's super exciting. One of the things we like to a lot on this podcast is mentorship and coaching. Uh, it's one of the things that I, I failed on early on in my restaurant career is, you know, thinking that I can do everything and figure out everything. You know, we have all these tools at our fingertips, but there's something that's so powerful when you find somebody that sits in that you want to be in and you ask yes. them for help. Um, have you had any guides or mentors along the way? And oh, what for did sure. They, yeah. What did, they, what did they teach you? Um, so I will say my, um, you know, I'm, I'm a young guy. I'm 30. How old am I? 34. Just turned 34. So 30, uh, yeah, 34. So, uh, yeah, I mean, to be in this position for one, I, I still pinch myself that I'm the executive chef of a stadium like this. I mean, it is amazing. Um, but I do give credit to the people that showed me the way. So, uh, down in Tampa, I was down in Tampa for four years at Buccaneers stadium. And, uh, I had a chef that was my mentor. He's the one that kind of, um, you know, pushed me to be better and, and learn. I had no clue what I was doing when I got down there as a sous chef, I got the opportunity to, be a sous chef. Uh, I was up here for the Braves in Atlanta. Um, still very green, got an opportunity to go down to Tampa. I literally picked up and moved uh, myself and, and my girlfriend at the time is now my wife and super green. I had no clue what I was doing. Jumped in and uh, he, he showed me the way. He opened up my wings, allowed me to fly. What um, was his name? His name was Kevin Riley. And he's, yeah. uh, he's actually a chef, a uh, corporate chef for Levy restaurants down in Tampa for uh, the Rays and uh, a couple other accounts. Beautiful. So, uh, cool. yeah, he, uh, he did a lot for me and I, I really appreciate it. Was there any story? Was there anything, was, do you have a particular story that you remembered where you thought you were doing something right? And he goes, that is not the way you do it, Matt. So not, not so much that more of, I, I see each area as a different discipline. So what I like to tell people, you know, we have 
we have four areas, concessions, catering, clubs, restaurants, um, and suites. And all four of those areas operate completely differently. And the reason I'm able to do what I do in this position is there's a, a switch in your head that you have to turn off and turn on for those different areas. So when you're talking to somebody about uh, concessions and you're talking about, um, you know, reconceptualizing a stand or anything, there's a lot of things that come into account with concessions that's completely different with suites. Um, suites food, you know, has to travel the entire stadium. So even at, you're firing, when you're firing the food, where it's going, who's pushing it, all those come into play. So um, what he taught me was changing that switch in my head when we're talking about different disciplines and how to act and react to those and what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And uh, I think a little of his OCD wore, uh, wore off on me as well. And that's, you know, OCD is, is definitely something that you see from a lot of chefs, um, very particular about certain things. And, and that's me through and through. Um, so, you know, between his teachings and, and uh, being a chef and, and even management, I, I, I had no clue and I still have no clue how, how I manage. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's something that you learn every day, right? I yeah. mean, it's, I'm learning and you, you had mentioned a second ago that you didn't, didn't mentor in the beginning of your career and made, made that mistake. I think that's what, what you're implying. Yeah. Um, and I'm in the same boat. Even right now, as we sit here, I had some great ideas um, to bring to light. And uh, I, it was a little premature. I wanted to, to really help people grow. And uh, I know a lot of people during this pandemic started their own thing and their own business and their own catering company. And I did as well. I did, I did some things on the side and kind of learned about business and entrepreneurship and figured I could help other people. So um, that was my goal, still is my goal. I'm a little slow at it right now. We're, we're trying to, um, you know, I'm taking on a lot of projects, um, but that is my overall goal is to be able to help people and mentor and the things that I've been taught and that I've taught myself as well, um, I want to be able to pass on. So that's something that I put in place um, a few months ago, and it, it's been slow moving, but I am um, bringing it back to light very soon because I want that to be a, a main uh, cause for what we're doing is helping other people. And one thing that um, we are going to do, and I, I actually have it in the works right now, which is a cool program. I don't know if you can see it, but um, probably not. I can turn the if camera you're afterwards. On, but... If you're watching on YouTube, he's uh, <coughs> showing off how this $1.5 billion stadium is beautiful. <laughs> this beautiful, beautiful uh Sports yeah, and we have a plated palace. actually right behind us. We have a thousand person plated on the field that we're preparing for for uh, Saturday night. So that'll be so a look fun at that one. a thousand per, a thousand person plated on. Uh, yeah, Atlanta we actually Falcon, have a three hundred on the Atlanta tomorrow. Falcons field. Yet he's finding time to put some uh, some media work in. So we're, <laughs> Try, we're all man. we're all a media company. Um, the more exactly the, the person listening to this podcast, the more that you consider yourself a media company. The the closer you are to a restaurant influencer. I like that. So yeah, the restaurant that I was trying to show you, it's called Molly B's. And, uh, you know, something that we do as chefs for a stadium is uh, during the off season, we can conceptualize new ideas and it, and it takes on off season to do that and come up with new items and test them out in R and D. And when you do that, you do it, you put it on the menu and it's there for the entire season. That's how stadiums have operated since the beginning of time. Recently, I figured why can't we do something like a restaurant does and, and do specials. And it's hard to say, do a special in a 70,000 person stadium, <laughs> but it doesn't have to be for everybody. And I think it's more special if it's not. So what we do is um, it's kind of a little competition between all the chefs. I think we've done it for the last five games. Um, each of my chefs comes up with a different item that they want to uh, feature during the game. We only make 50 of them. It's usually a, a, a wow item, like I, I like to call it. Um, and the last one we did was the rack of ribs. It was an entire rack of ribs that was, um, you know, uh, smoked together. And then we stuffed it with a bunch of different smoked meats and barbecue sauce and garnish. Um, awesome. and it fed, you know, two to three people. So we're, we're taking the, um, the old idea of concessions where it's just one and done menu for the whole season. And we're just trying to inject some fun and some different things in there and, and be able to have the creativity come back, um, to the stadium so people can get excited about it. Um, watch my Instagram because we, we show the behind the scenes of how we're coming up with these items and the R and D involved. And then when you come to a game, you get to experience, you know, if you're one of the first 50 people to get to the stand, we have a little countdown clock that shows how many are left, um, just like at a, a deli counter. I love it. Um, so when someone orders it, we press the button and it goes down from 50 to 49 and so on. So just a little fun thing like that is, uh, you know, a big push to, to bring um, creativity back. Because that's one thing. If, if we don't continue our creativity, it, it just kind of dies down and we get bored and you know, that's, that's part of the, the repetition that, you know, I, I want to make sure that we're, we're staying lively and, and having fun with it. 
So one of the things we we definitely talk about every single episode is is technology. Technology has come into our all of our lives, no matter not just in the hospitality business, but it's been accelerated in the pandemic. Things that have already been happening, you know, things that we can do as an independent barbecue restaurant in San Diego that we were never never able to do before, you know, with third party delivery, with integrating, with bringing toast into our restaurant. I mean, so many awesome things and exciting things have helped us. When you're talking about scale at a stadium of your size, what kind of tools, technology tools, do you guys lean on um, that helps you better provide hospitality to that many fans in the seats? Yeah. So that's actually a really good question. If it was up to me, I would have a robot, the, uh, what's his name? Uh, not Skippy. There's, there's Lip, a, a robot, Flippy, Flippy. I would Flippy. have a Flippy, Flippy yes, in every Flippy. concession stand just Massimo. for the fun of it. So um, yeah, Massimo, <laughs> we, we actually leave you as a, um, uh, they've looked at it. They've done it at Dodger Stadium, I think it is. I've, I've read couple, about. But, I've read about yeah. the Levy, Levy innovations over there. Yeah, so that, that's actually yeah. big with Levy is is being innovative. And you know, when the pandemic hit, um, I was fortunate enough to. Um, we were already doing. We were the first stadium to do cashless in the entire stadium. Um, I love it. And I read about. Yeah, it. it was it was a cool thing. It was so very it, forward it thinking. Yeah, and it, I mean, it, the, everywhere is every stadium is now cashless, and there's no exactly. reason to go back. Yeah. And, and the speed of service, I mean, immediately you could see the speed of service jumped up just from not having to fumble with cards and, you know, yep. all that, that whole process. So um, what we did was during the pandemic, when we knew we were going to obviously open back up at some point, um, we started building an app in-house for mobile ordering. Great. So we piloted this at uh, one of our stands and, you know, we, we built the technology, actually funny story behind this um, real quick. When we were building this technology, I heard um, there's a guy named Andrew that works at the stadium. Um, and he's going to be the one that's building this technology. So he's, he's going to be your main contact. So I was like, okay, cool. Let's, let's go up, you know, we'll meet him. And, uh, I go up there and uh, I'm waiting and I see this guy walking up and this is Andrew We're we're supposed to be meeting to, you know, start the conversation. And it's my buddy from high school that I've known since the beginning of time that, you know, after high school, we lost touch and, and didn't really talk. I know no he was way. still in Atlanta, but he was the one that was building this technology. So, um, between, you know, us and obviously there's a lot more people involved. I, I didn't have my hand too heavy in it, but um, ultimately he was, uh, one of my old buddies is the one that built this technology. Um, we put it in place, which was, uh, you know, a fun thing to do and, and see how it works and what doesn't work. And, um, God, we spent days and days and hours just going over logistics and how it's going to work and the, the food movement for these stands and how we're going to expedite it. And we ended up launching it. Um, it was successful. We, we brought it out to quite a few more stands. So it's forward thinking, like you said, and, and being interested in technology, um, that has definitely helped us pave the way. There's so many stories like that, that we've done at the stadium, um, that goes to show, you know, there's when, where there's a will, there's a way. I mean, when we first opened, everyone was telling Arthur Blank, who's the owner, um, and, uh, founder of Home Depot that he can't do $2 hot dogs. You can't, you know, I, that's not a good business model, right? Brilliant. No, it was the most and brilliant. It's the I mean, smartest I, move that anyone's ever made. I mean, we yes. now a lot more stadiums are taking that and, uh, you know, we, we went from serving maybe 10,000 hot dogs to 20 or 30,000 hot dogs and just pumped up the volume. And at the same time, you're making people happy. So that's, yep. that's the thing you know, if the whole family can come to a stadium, which they do, um, we're known for, you know, serving thousands of slices of pizza and 20, 30,000 hot dogs and burgers and chicken tenders. Those are the volume items that we pump out of here because of Arthur's forward thinking and, and making it affordable. Um, and it's allowed us to, uh, to really do some, some cool things. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a testament to the leadership um, that's running that stadium. The fact that, you know, I, I mean, I obviously anything that's hospitality oriented, um, anything having to do with stadiums, I'm going to read about. And not only did I read about it in the traditional places, but I read about it all over in, I mean, just local news here in San Diego, people were talking about it because it was so forward thinking. It was so different out of the box. And yet, you know, what I love is you talked about that switch. You know, there is a switch to provide that great, affordable, fantastic hot dog at a cheap price so that people, you know, a family can go and enjoy the game. But then that switch also has to be turned once you go to the executive suites and you're talking to the, you know, the visas of the world and the Pepsis and all the people that are exactly the Super Bowl. So, yep. yeah, that was, that, that's great information. Um, what kind of advice do you have anybody that's listening to this podcast that wants to get in? I mean, what I love about your story is you're a chef, you're in food, you're in hospitality, and you're in such a different niche that somebody wouldn't think, like when you think about being a chef, you don't think I get to go serve 70,000 people and I get to go yeah, yeah. and put on the biggest event in the world, the Super Bowl. Um, what kind of advice would you have if someone wants to go an unconventional path, um, kind of like you took? Yeah. So my path, you know, again, super unconventional. And, and I, I got afforded a lot of uh, good opportunities that I like to think I, I 
uh, manifested on my own. But at the end of the day, again, advice that I got from somebody, I forgot who it was, but um, they had told me, do the job that's above you without being asked. So then when a position opens up, you're already doing that position. You're already doing that job. You know how to do it. And the company has no other choice but to put you in that position. So I took that to heart and I really, you know, thought about that. And, and uh, that's actually how I ended up getting down to Tampa. Um, and that's how I got up here to Atlanta and, and got this position ultimately. So um, that advice I, I've given a hundred, you know, hundreds of times, it, it really does work. Um, and it's all about attitude too. I, I like to tell people, first off, I never went to culinary school. Um, I, I, again, taught myself and had great mentors, um, but you don't have to have culinary school. You don't have to have conventional ways to uh, get to positions like this. If you work hard, you know, bust your butt and, and um, your attitude, honestly, that's the biggest thing is uh, um, continue learning and teaching yourself, but your attitude has to be on 100% of the time. If it's not and you're 80% 80, 80 good and then 20%, you fly off the handle, um, people notice that. People see that and when that opportunity comes, it's not going to be afforded to you. It's not going to be given to you because you're, you're, you know, you're not consistent. So consistency, um, I learned early on is key and just making sure you always have a good attitude, smile on your face. It's super hard at times, especially in the times we're living right now. Um, but I, you know, I, I try to remember that and, and take that to heart, not just speak it, but also do it. So one of the things when someone sees, you know, your success and they see the position that you're in and they see, you know, all the accolades that come with it, or they look at, you know, us as a barbecue restaurant podcasting with entrepreneur and bringing in Yelp and working with toast and doing all these incredible things. It's easy to look at the successes and go, I can never be there. One of the things that we love to do is talk about failure. You know, there's so many things that I fail with on a daily basis, which is why every day I'm trying to be a little bit better. Do you have any recent failures um, that you can share with uh, with the people listening to know that, you know, you are just as human as everybody else? I mean, you, you oh, lead yeah. a team. Lead leadership is a lonely place, but I think the more that as leaders that we share, you know, our vulnerabilities, um, the more that the listener can go, well, hey, I can do that too. Yeah, actually, you know what direction I want to take on that question? I, I love the question is um, allowing people to fail. That's something I literally just just thought of that because it's it's been something that I'm struggling with as I just mentioned earlier is is my management management style and and learning and what I'm learning right now about myself is there's there's a line of managing and micromanaging and what I tend to do because I have OCD and I, I tend to micromanage a little too much and I'm still trying to figure out where that line is sometimes I don't allow people to learn on their own and possibly fail. Um, and that sometimes can be, you know, a little overbearing. So I think it's important to fail um, because you won't learn unless you fail. And if you're, if you're not failing, then you're not trying new things. So um, failure is not bad. It's not a bad thing. It's bad if you continue on that path and continue failing at the same thing. Um, but if you, if you take a failure and learn from it, then that's, that's the point of what we're doing. So, you know, for this event that we have behind us, we have uh, tomorrow, a 300 person play to lunch, 300 person play to dinner. And then Saturday is the thousand person on the field. Um, you know, the, the smaller ones, we're, we're good to go. The thousand person that takes a lot of strategy and logistics, like I talked about. And, um, we've sat in six hours worth of meetings, just talking about logistics and timing for the, for that event on the field. Um, but I guess what I'm getting at is, is allowing people to fail so they can learn from those mistakes, but, um, there definitely is a line that you have to kind of, kind of watch and, you know, don't, don't let them fail. Uh, too bad, but, you know, give them the good pointers and good feedback. But, um, you know, it's important to learn from those failures so you don't make the same mistakes. I love that. Um, the, the last thing I want to ask about is something that we, we take very seriously, and that's micro daily habits, um, things that we've implemented. You can list, you can implement um, something that you do personally or professionally recently um, that you've added to your um, habit schedule that's really helped you move forward. Do you have anything? I do. So one thing um, I'm new to social media and this is, you know, right now I'm pushing extremely hard on Instagram and, you know, getting our story out and, um, you know, waking up in the morning. When I wake up, I used to look at my phone as soon as I opened my eyes and, you know, start looking at emails and then look at the news. And um, I've learned lately that when you go from zero to a hundred, and by that, I mean, when you wake up and, and have your brain just start clicking, you know, full, full on, it's not a good thing. You need to allow your time. And, you know, I just want to speak for myself. I, I need to allow my time to let my brain wake up. And I've learned, I, I think I heard this from a podcast that somebody didn't take meetings until 10 o'clock every morning. And I thought that was kind of weird because obviously we get into work, we have a lot of stuff to do, but I've learned that my creativity does not really spark until my mind wakes up and my mind doesn't wake up 
until I get out in the sunlight and, you know, I drive to work and I get my cup of coffee and, and all that. Um, that's when my brain really starts to, to run and, and fire on all cylinders and be creative. So what I've done lately is for the first hour of waking up, I will not touch my phone. I won't look at it. Um, and that was a very tough thing for me to do. But what I'm learning is it's allowing me to, first of all, think of something other than social media and news and politics and all that kind of stuff. It allows me to think of what I'm doing at the stadium. What's, you know, what's the task for the day. Um, and I've learned that's, that's been very helpful to myself and, uh, not going from zero to hundred just like that. So that's, that would be one, one thing that I put in place, uh, pretty recently that I've seen success at. I love it. Um, Thank so you. anybody listening to this podcast, uh, you can get in touch with me on any social platform at Sean P. Walchef or at Cali BBQ Media. We're grateful that you listen to the show. We hope you share the show. Um, hopefully, Chef Matt Cooper has inspired you um, to think a little bit differently about those big stadium events that you uh, you attend, knowing that, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, you know the hospitality is all around us, whether you're at a stadium, whether you're at a restaurant, whether you're at a bar, nightclub, doesn't matter where you are, hospitality is all around us. Um, what we hope is that you can take something from this podcast to, uh, to make your life better, to, to actually put you in the position to start using the tools necessary. Like Matt said, I mean, he's been doing all this incredible work, but he's just recently launched his Instagram page. And the more that you can document what you're doing, the better stories that you can tell of all the people that work behind the scenes to highlight, you know, the amazing work that is going on, because the work that you're doing is important. The work that you're doing is, is vital to, uh, to Atlanta, to sports entertainment, and more importantly, to the hospitality industry. So thank you so much, you. Uh, Chef Matt, for, be for oh, being absolutely. on the show. Thank you, Sean. And uh, anybody listening, please also uh, join us on Clubhouse. Um, Chef Matt is on Clubhouse. I am on Clubhouse. Um, thanks to Troy Hooper for connecting uh, me and Chef Matt together. Uh, the yes. amazing thing is all the all the tools that we need to connect with the greatest uh, people that inspire us are, are it's right in our pocket. It's that smartphone. Yep, so absolutely. Yeah, if you're afraid. not on Clubhouse, get on Clubhouse. That was yeah. the spark that inspired me. There's a lot right. of good people on there. There you go. So stay curious, get involved, and uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. We will catch you guys next week. Hey guys, it's Sean, host of the Restaurant Influencers Podcasts and owner of Cali Barbecue. We have been using Yelp since we opened in 2008 to share our story, but more importantly, respond to reviews and to claim our business page. If you go to Yelp for restaurants, you can Google that. It will take you to a page and a suite of services that help you better manage your business. Recently, I was looking at our website analytics for our brand and I found out the number one social media site that is referring traffic to our business is actually Yelp. It's not TikTok, it's not Facebook, it's not Instagram. We believe in smartphone storytelling, which is why we put on this podcast, but Yelp is such a powerful platform to help share the brand story of your business and actually convert those people that are searching online into actual paid customers. So check out Yelp for restaurants and be sure to tune in to the next week's show. Thanks.